Age 19 is Alina. She enjoys watching Hollywood movies with her mechanic lover Sergei and wearing fashionable clothing. She also has a smartphone addiction, just like the majority of young people in Russia. However, Alina's online life has turned terrifyingly violent since President Vladimir Putin led an invasion army into Ukraine on February 24, 2022. She is a member of Generation Z. She used to have a bottomless obsession with conspiracy theories about the war, which are spread by government-run groups with names like C for Victory, Strength in Truth, Real Ukraine, and anti terror on VK, the Russian Facebook used by 70 million people. She spreads and reports false information about child killers and neo-Nazis in Ukraine, along with ominous NATO group threats that Russia is in danger. She feels that the only way to save the Ukrainian people is to eradicate their language, culture, and government. Apocalyptic pictures of a burning White House in fashion DC are all over her homepage. Putin is referred to as Russia's savior, and the Ukrainian flag has been nicknamed the Devil's Swastika. Nothing could have been more significant to Alina two years ago than a shopping trip to Moscow which was 1,000 kilometers away from her home in the mining town of Nizhny Tagil. But thirst for war has replaced a love of fancy clothing. You crow fascists, you are rabid dogs. The white of our Russian flag means cleanliness. If I were in charge, you cockholes, a derogatory term for Ukrainians, would get what you deserve. And God is with our boys. Kill the treacherous scum are just a few of the statements she publishes on a daily basis. How did Alina, along with thousands of other young Russians, get so engrossed in online violence and hatred? Do they genuinely believe what they say? Or is it all rhetoric? What will happen to Russia and the rest of us if the world's largest nuclear power is taken over by a new generation of enraged, fascist Alinas? Following the devastating defeats suffered by the Russian military during Putin's invasion, his allies in the Orthodox Church and the media launched a constant campaign of defamation. Social media was awash with pictures of kids who had allegedly been slain by Ukrainian military and saved by Russian troops. Calls for genocide were made using macho, sexist, and homophobic terminology. Russian adversaries are frequently referred to as F asterisk 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 arts. Women, blacks, and N asterisk 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 ours. Ukrainians are frequently called diseased, beasts, monsters, animals, and a terrifying term to deny their humanity, nelud or unpeople, in a manner reminiscent of Nazism. One well known blogger scoffed. Why poison a handful of cockroaches with sarin when there are a host of simpler and cheaper ways to do it? In response to accusations that Russia had deployed chemical weapons, nothing is done by the Russian Orthodox Church to deter violence. From the pulpit of Moscow's Cathedral of the Armed Forces, a state-funded megachurch, its head, Patriarch Kirill, bestows blessings on the armed forces. The state and religion are inseparable, according to pundits who claim that the Russian patriarch believes in Putin instead of believing in God. There were initially anti-war demonstrations, isolated protests against the government's policies, students holding blank protest banners on Moscow's Red Square or covered in fake blood outside of universities went viral in the West, but were largely disregarded in Russia except by the security forces. In the first three weeks of the war, about 15,000 individuals were detained. Heavies and hooligans attacked journalists in the open for trying to cover the crackdown. A harsh new rule that prohibited distributing fake news about the Russian army threatened civilians with fines of up to 1.5 million rubles, more than 20 times the monthly average wage of just under 58,000 rubles, or up to 15 years in prison. A few famous people spoke up. Unexpected voices of reason, like Ivan Ergent, the host of a long-running and wildly successful late-night discussion show on state television, quickly found themselves out of a job and out of the country, escaping to Israel, Cyprus and other countries.
Putin declared that fifth columnists who needed to be cleaned were a greater threat to Russians than just outside forces. There were spies and adversaries everywhere, always working for a mysterious cabal of forces that comprised the United States, Ukraine, and globalists. Television footage saw alleged spies being forcibly apprehended, with bodies being tossed onto sidewalks and stairwells and front doors being destroyed with battering rams. Traitor to the motherland and don't sell out your nation. B asterisk DCH were scrawled on the front doors of those who were allegedly traitors. There were traitors to be found everywhere. Moderate voices were swiftly eliminated in the security and police forces, who were not exempt. Teachers who allegedly misrepresented the battle were immediately dismissed. Even cultural icons like the singer Ola Pugacheva risk being derided as scum on social media if they express skepticism about the special military operation. Within a few weeks, an estimated 200,000 Russians fled the country, relocating to former Soviet nations like Georgia, Armenia, and Kazakhstan that have sizable Russian-speaking populations. Any protest movement was effectively over by the end of March. The Kremlin's propaganda machine went into overdrive in April when information of a Russian massacre in Bucha, a suburb of Ukraine's capital Kiev, was made public by Western media. Images of dead people with their wrists bound and eyes covered, as well as maimed remains in torture chambers at schools, were criticized as fakes produced by the CIA and other adversaries of Russia. Russian social media users, particularly teenagers, erupted in a deafening clamor demanding the extermination of diseased Ukrainian vermin. One frequent cry was, they deserve to die. We must murder them if asterisk 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 oz, someone said. Alina chimed in, saying, Butcher, I'm going to make another butcher. I'll instruct them. Yukis, come have a gay pride parade in Tijil. We'll turn it into a meat grinder. She said, embracing the horrors and announcing her desire to take part in a genocide against the two enemies of the state, homosexuals and Ukrainians. The phrase meat grinder refers to the massacre that Red Army soldiers experienced during World War II, a conflict that claimed the lives of 25 million Soviet citizens. DC Generation's youthful members praised the crimes more the worse they were. Hash were no tashamed was everywhere along with the hashtag hash no. For these young people, the conflict in Ukraine has evolved into a campaign to purify Russia, which to them is a nation that exists everywhere Moscow formerly ruled and anywhere Russian is spoken. The Soviet era catchphrase, Boba Zemir, battle for peace, is repeated everywhere. Liberals, progressives, gays, feminists, and people of color are naturally outside of the Russian culture. The idea of Ukraine, a nation that has never existed in history and does not exist today, is the most un-Russian of all. This rhetoric of devastation is permeating all of Russia. Politicians, journalists, and commentators compete on nightly talk shows to make the most absurd claims. The US is on the verge of collapse. Vladimir Zelensky the president of Ukraine, is a Nazi. Russian troops will soon win the conflict. And Ukrainians are killing Russian women and children. The discourse of the last times has reached hysterical proportions. Margarita Simonian, editor of Russia Today, shrugged when Kremlin officials started openly discussing the use of nuclear weapons, saying, we will go to heaven while they will just kick the bucket. Many pro-war TV celebrities promote Armageddon as a certainty, the final act of ethnic cleansing and sometimes predicted nuclear annihilation is viewed as the greatest sacrifice Russia can make. Similar to how British teens pay little attention to party political broadcasts, teenagers in Russia are not particularly interested in statements made through official media and television. See generation, however consumes these concepts through memes, videos, and the avalanche of comments that appear on their smartphone screens. This symbol alone has very little cultural significance in Russia. In Russian, Z means for. Thus C might indicate for peace, for defense, 
for the future, or just for Russia. This phrase was created by Putin's public relations teams to unify the nation in the wake of the retreat from Kiev. The president's approval rating, which reached an all-time low in 2013, surged to more than 80% when Russian troops annexed Crimea in 2014. Putin's popularity increased after the establishment of the Youth Army in 2016, a project for educating young men and women in the military and designed by the Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. It attempts to transform the youth into soldiers of Russian nationalism and to prepare them for military service by putting an emphasis on healthy living and moral and spiritual development. Youth Army members parade for hours on end. On holidays, they participate in parades. After school, they march. They march around gyms. They march in the neighborhood. And when they're not marching, they're attending classes, visiting troops in the field or lending a hand to veterans in need. But above all, they are getting ready for battle. The members are supposed to stay in condition through constant physical training, which is finished off with yearly sporting events. Even the youngest participants, those six years old, are taught how to disassemble and rebuild grenade throwers and Kalashnikovs, while older teenagers practice firing weapons during summer camps and after-school activities. They also dress in protective suits and gas masks in order to be ready for nuclear and chemical strikes. Children hurried to sign up right away, between the ages of 6 and 18. There were 380,000 youth army participants as of 2019. The majority of them were from less affluent areas of south and western Russia, close to Belarus and Ukraine. The program actively seeks applicants from orphanages and makes the premise that doing so will protect vulnerable kids from crime and drunkenness. Nikita, who hails from Saratov, 500 miles southeast of Moscow, is an example of a typical youth army veteran. He paraded on holidays, attended extra education sessions to learn about Russia's glorious history, and spent four years in uniform. But learning to use firearms was his favorite part because he has always been interested in things like special ops. Nikita now has an internet addiction. He spends his evenings alone in his bedroom, fighting foreign lies and supporting Putin. He claims that because of how much he enjoyed his time in the youth army, he will put off starting college in order to enlist in the Russian army and fight in Ukraine. Girls become eager online soldiers just as well. In a hamlet outside of Volgograd, 14-year-old Maria enjoys sharing videos of herself online while wearing a youth army uniform. She lip-syncs and dances to popular music. But every few posts, military imagery breaks up her adolescent outbursts. Maria is preparing to march while watching a parade. The two converge into one realm. Maria cocks her head while seated in her bedroom and flicks her beret in the direction of the camera. She gestures to the hashtags volunteer, love yourself, and youthful. This is a positive internet self-help slogan used by a militaristic youth group, but it's also a significant military force. In the summer of 2022, the European Union classified the outfit as a paramilitary group and put it to its list of sanctions. Lloyd Myladina Sova, the human rights ombudsman for Ukraine, issued an online statement in which she expressed concerns that, in reaction to its significant army losses, Russia wants to put members of the youth army on the battlefield. Many of the adolescents also declare that they are prepared to fight. One adolescent uploads a video to TikTok in which he does acrobatic firing drills with an army rifle in the school gym. I'm come to save people, he captions this, overlaid. A little child reads aloud an imperfect rendition of a war poetry from the Soviet era while standing at attention in combat trousers and a red youth army t-shirt. In a video, an older youngster who has attended a number of summer camps boasts of mastering the art of knife throwing to the point where he is able to instruct the younger recruits. A video of young people practicing in a forest was uploaded by a group from Sakhalin, a Russian island in the Far East. In response to their commander's yelled orders, 
The young soldiers fall to the ground, take up positions for firing, and advance along a forested route. In the propaganda for the Z generation, children are a recurring motif. A soldier at the front posts an old photograph of glum Soviet youngsters waiting in a queue to be detained and possibly executed by German invaders. Don't worry, we're co-acting it now, he captions it. A shaky video of a chubby blonde youngster dressed in infantry military fatigues and a tank commander's headgear was shared to VK and telegram groups last summer. The youngster joyfully runs along a dirt path from his house to the major road leading to Kharkiv, Ukraine, while alternating between running and bouncing. He waves imploringly at the military columns advancing to the front. He goes through this daily process of saluting his heroes and his eight-year-old Alyosha from Veselaya Lopin. His great act of patriotism enthralled social media users, who exclaimed, this is going to warm your heart. Alyosha rose to internet fame. When he met Putin, a top Kremlin official referred to him as the future of our Russia. His picture is now emblazoned on everything, including t-shirts and school notepads. Even Alyosha chocolate bars exist. He is the ideal child soldier and the representative of Z generation.